Good evening. This is Phil Chetwind of the Network of Photographers for Palestine welcoming you to this first in our monthly series of events to mark the 75th anniversary of the Nakba. Over the coming year, we will be featuring Palestinian photographers, filmmakers, poets and writers. We do this from a conviction that Palestinian culture matters. It is the lifeblood of the Palestinian people telling their story when others either stay silent or attempt to distort this story. Over the year we will be presenting photographic exhibitions from our many contacts in Palestine, films by the renowned filmmaker Farad Nambulsi, uh, visits of photographers from as far afield as Bethlehem and San Francisco, and talks by renowned writers such as Ilan Pape and Ramzi Baroud. So we hope that you can join us at one or more of these events and now over to Dr. Isam Basalat to introduce tonight's event. Okay, good evening everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Network of Photographer for Palestine for arranging this uh, discussion and I'm honored to moderate it. I'm not going to talk too much, but to let my panel here to uh, introduce their understanding what does mean to stand up for Palestinian, what does mean solidarity. Obviously we're talking about many aspects of the Palestinian cause and the good news that the Palestinian cause thanks to the effort of many individual and institutions all over the world, it became a subject of a day, not only the only Zionist narrative and which dominated for years the, the, the public and the politician. So here we, ho we have three very experienced and long-standing supporters of the Palestinian cause. Eirik as a chair of Scottish Palestinian Society campaign and a member of the Green Party as well as uh, author of the environmental aspect of the Palestinian cause. We have Naomi who is a long-standing anti-Zionist Jews from Glasgow, which is very important uh, issue. Having said that, the Zionist claiming that they're representing the whole Jews in the world as a whole, which is not true. Never been true and not true in the past, never today. And we have Mick, obviously Mick, he is a grassroots and organizer and the founder of Scottish Palestine Society campaign. A long story of not only defining what does mean solidarity for Palestine, but practically putting it in practice. So here we go. I will let you go. Eirek, if you wanted okay, to start. Thank you, thank you very much, Sam. Um, uh, thank you to the Network of Palestinian Photographers for organizing this event and a particular thank you to Mike Miniter for lending me his glasses so I can read my notes since I broke my glasses on the train on the way here. Um, so <laughs> um, if, I, if, I go in, if I'm doing this, it's because Mike's eyes are not quite the same as mine. Try this as well if you wish. share the same vision. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, is, is, that, to try is that this more? Uh, uh, I've got a range of glasses here yeah. to try. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, when I prepared what I was going to say, I was thinking that um, I might be speaking to people who might not be Palestine activists. I can see in front of me a number, you know, all of the audience could be in, sitting in my seat as activists talking about what really is solidarity with Palestine. So I'm hoping this is a prompt for discussion rather than me and bringing in any particular 
uh, expertise or, or, or insights, but I'm, I'm happy to share a few thoughts uh, with that, that in mind. Um, so, first of all, um, as, as, as Sam said, I'm, I'm an environmentalist, and really my conversion from being uh, somebody sympathetic to the cause of Palestine towards being somebody who was active in solidarity with Palestine really came through my environmentalism. Um, and I'm sure that everybody here has got different stories about how they became uh, active in, in solidarity with, with Palestine. But if I tell my story uh, about as an environmentalist, I mean, uh, my first proper job was as an environmental scientist. I worked in environmental education for a while. I worked for Friends of the Earth for a while. So I, I've been involved in that kind of uh, environmentalism for, for a long time. And um, I had the opportunity in 2010 to take part in a study tour of the Jewish National Fund organized by Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Um, uh, Jewish National Fund, as I'm sure people here know, claims to be an environmental organization. If you look at their website, they claim to be um, the world's oldest environmental organization and Israel's biggest environmental organization. They talk about the work that they do planting trees, protecting forests, um, providing parks for, for access. Um, research into water, um, uh, water um, con conservation, um, environmental education, etc. And of course, during the study tour, um, we saw the parks and the forests that the JNF uh, had, and the the uh, remains of the Palestinian villages that have been depopulated by the JNF or by uh, at the instruction of the JNF um, and the destruction of the villages on that land. So it became very clear that what the JNF was, was an agent of uh, settler colonization, of ethnic cleansing. And so that was, um, if you like, my introduction uh, to what is at the heart of the issue in Israel and Palestine, is that Israel is a settler colonial project uh, uh, which means that it is uh, about ethnic cleansing, eth ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. And the, and the JNF, when it was set up in 1901, that was very clear what it was about. It was a, it was a colonial uh, organization uh, designed to replace the indigenous Palestinian population with um, uh, Jewish settlers from uh, out with uh, Palestine. Um, <clears throat> so if their environmental organization is essentially a, 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 a fundamentally a tool of, of ethnic cleansing. That gave me a kind of clue as to uh, what solidarity with the Palestinian people uh, might be. So initially, I, what I did was, was start to talk, uh, talk to other environmentalists, put motions to organizations I was involved with, particularly Friends of the Earth. Uh, I was on the board of Friends of the Earth at the time. I put a motion about the JNF, a motion about Palestine, and found a very uh, receptive audience amongst the environmentalists. When people uh, found when the, the story that I've just said was explained to them, that this so-called environmental organization was a greenwash for ethnic cleansing, and it exposes that the, the Zionist project is actually one of settler colonialism, then people understood it. Um, and similar um, messages went around other environmental organizations. Um, and so I got a bit of a name for talking about Palestine in environmental circles, and as a result of which I was invited by Friends of the Earth International to take part in an observer mission, uh, what they called an observer mission to Palestine, to feed back to Friends of the Earth International, the confederation of Friends of the Earth groups, 70-odd um, members all over the world, <coughs> about the situation in, in Palestine. So uh, I, I did, went to the West Bank, was, was shown various environmental violations within the West Bank that directly resulted from the Israeli occupation and was uh, part of a uh, co-author of a report with uh, uh, Abir al Butma from Palestine and Bobby Peak from South Africa um, called Environmental Nakba. Um, you can 
Google Environmental Network. It's on. It's it's available online. Um, uh, basically, uh, telling the story about how the the Israeli occupation um, was part of a uh, using the environment to uh, ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, which is why we called it Environmental Nakba. The Nakba didn't end in 1948, as we all know. Um, the ethnic cleansing of, of Palestinians has been an ongoing project, and the environmental devastation is just one of the tools that's being used. Having written that uh, report, it went into Friends of the International, and it, um, <clears throat> uh, along with various other things, and I wouldn't want to overstate my part in this, but it was a small uh, contribution to what uh, the expulsion of an organization which was calling itself Friends of the Earth Middle East from the Friends of the Earth International Confederation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Friends of the Earth, what was Friends of the Earth Middle East, now called EcoPeace, was um, uh, an alliance of Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis working together, promoting themselves as we need to work together to save the environment, but in doing so, would not critique the colonization of Palestine. They were a normalization project, as we, as we would call them. So I suppose, in terms of the question about what really is solidarity, mm -hmm. is distinguishing between what is genuinely anti-colonial uh, solidarity and what is masquerading support for uh, Palestinian projects in, in Palestine or the State of Israel, um, but is actually a form of normalization, distinguishing between whatever comes in the name of peace or in the name of collaboration or whatever, but distinguishing between that and what is genuinely uh, anti-colonial, decolonizing project. So that would be my one uh, lesson for um, what is genuinely uh, solidarity. The second point, I think, I don't need to say very much about this to this audience, but BDS. BDS, of course, is the call from Palestinian civil society, what they require of international community to uh, take solidarity, boycott, divest, and sanction, to isolate Israel, to expose the fact that they are in breach of international law. It's, it's, it, BDS is not really a decolonizing project. It's, it's, it's uh, simply exposing the breach of, uh, breaches of international law in terms of the apartheid laws within the State of Israel, in terms of the ongoing colonization, the, the occupation well beyond what the Geneva Convention um, permits of, um, uh, of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, uh, the, the, the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. Um, and the right of return of the, of the refugees. So these are, these are simply where Israel is in breach of, of international law. But what the Palestinian civil society have asked of the international community is if the pressure is put on Israel to isolate the, the state of Israel, it creates an opportunity for Palestinian popular resistance itself to decolonize that territory. Decolonization can't occur in the international community. It can only occur by the pa Palestinian popular resistance, but they have asked us to support that through BDS. The third just point... Can, can I just let you know that you have three minutes left? Three minutes left. <laughs> okay. The third point is all I was going to say is that from civil society in Palestine to civil society in Scotland, what we do as individuals is, is, is one thing, but it's, it's the organizations across civil society that makes it strong. The environmentalists, the church groups, the arts organizations, the, the trade unions, the, um, the cultural organizations, the, the, the educational organizations. And that is the third point that I would say about what genuine solidarity, what is really solidarity with Palestine is, is making it more than just a small group of people like we are quite used to speaking to one another in this room but make it a, a, an exercise of, of civil society. One final point I just wanted to make, which is uh, added in as a, from yesterday, where we, uh, SPSC had a, a, a talk from um, Manal Shkaya, who's been doing some work in Masafayata. Many of you will know about Masafayata and what's happening there, and the, um, the, the occupying forces are, are um, turning it into a, a firing zone and, and evicting the population there, particularly Bedouin, Bedouin population. Um, I, I had the, the privilege of visiting Masafayata 
uh, about seven or eight years ago. Um, and what uh, Manal is saying is what the people of Masafayata are asking for now is for internationals to try and get to Masafayata, to stay there for um, a, a number of months in order to make it much more difficult for the Israeli occupying forces to, to evict them. So there's a sp specific call for some kind of solidarity. So through the networks that, that we all have, uh, would particularly uh, ask that you look for people who are in a position who might be able to go to the West Bank uh, at fairly short notice, running all the risks of, of, of the difficulties of trying to get there at the moment, but in order to stand in solidarity with the people of Masafiata. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Eric. That covers a lot from the environment to involving actively, not only the BDS, but practically going there and see by yourself what's happening there, which is very important. So, we'll keep the discussion later for any questions. So, I'm um, just... Naomi, please, if you wanted to say a few words okay. for 15 minutes, what solidarity means to you. <clears throat> well, thanks for inviting me, network of uh, Palestinian photographers. Um, just to introduce myself, as, as, as I'm said, I'm a Scottish anti-Zionist Jew. I've been, I'm a member of uh, Scott Jazz and also part of the Jewish Network for Palestine and also Jewish Voice for Peace. So I'm going to talk from a perspective of how Jewish people have, have this duty within the diaspora to, to help the world understand that we're not all Zionists and we never have been. And the diaspora has millions of Jewish people who have no interest in one particular homeland. Um, the, the element of solidarity. Um, solidarity, according to Melanie Kantrovitz, is the political version of love. So the power of love needs to be translated into the political movements that we try to be part of. And I think for the strength to support the Palestinians, now has become a time in the 75th year of the Nakba and with the beginning of the most right-wing, blatantly murderous government of Israel to see people come together the world over and make statements politically to, to, to their representatives the world over. Sorry, just pulling the microphone up. Technical issue. Um, I'm not as well versed as uh, I rig to speak without reading notes, so I'm going to read what I've got. <laughs> so ultimately, I see solidarity as meaning the collective action to achieve the stated aims, and as I was referring to on a political level, I'm a trade unionist as well. I'm currently, um, <clears throat> I've been um, elected now as international officer within my branch. So I'm going to use that position to try and promote every bit of information I can within uh, Unison. Um, and within that context, I actually managed to be part of a delegation that went to Palestine in 2016 with Unison. And there I had six days of four meetings a day with different, different organisations, different groups. It was very intense. But after having actually been in um, Israel as a 17-year-old, when my family thought I, I could be dispensed of and be a good Zionist, um, I remembered in that visit in 2016 all the propaganda that I heard when I was 17. And it was quite an eye-opener to me because I had quite a chaotic younger life. So I didn't carry a lot of political knowledge until my life calmed down a bit and I started absorbing um, political events. And since 2016, the length of, not the length, the volume of knowledge that I have amassed and also seek much more of is about where did Zionism begin to form itself in, in terms of operating with impunity, with the level of cruelty that absorbs their minds. Because the Zionist movement, to me, seems to have thrived in cruelty, brutality amongst its own, as well as this drive of hatred that it has to function in order to achieve its colonial 
colonial set settler goals in the land of Palestine. So there's quite a lot to learn, and, and all of it is, is interlaced with um, involvement from our government in Britain and, of course, the American government that funds Israel through all the tax dollars. And young Jews today in America are much well, much better informed about the level of involvement that their government in America is using their money to fund the murder of people in Palestine and what we see is the potential of greater Israel. So there's no, there's no point that I can see where Israel has operated as a defensive nation. It's been an aggressor. It's been an aggressor since it started in 1948. The British mandate set the path 100 years ago and started this, this brutality towards people in a land where they had lived for generations where they had tended the land, where they have brought up many generations of wonderful people who know how to have a relationship with their land. That's not what happens at the moment. The land is governed by machinery, and as, as Eirig was saying, the environmental Nakba is something I'm becoming more aware of, how they've spread herbicides in order to experiment on how crops can be damaged, how and what effect it has on the population as a term, in terms of um, social control. And the issue that is coming about as a result of the Zionist movement in particular is this confusion and conflation of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Anti-Semitism is a serious issue. Anti-Zion accusing critic and if you're accusing people who criticise Israel of being anti-Semitic, I see that as a cheap diversion of what the real meaning of anti-Semitism is. And a lot of attacks on Jewish cemeteries um, within diasporic communities is actually hatred of Israel. And, and they're promoting this and they're encouraging this. Anyway, I'm not reading any of my notes. I've gone off. <laughs> gone off. Often a rant. Um, but if we want to look at um, activism and where it's been successful um, and lessons that we've learned in the past, we can look at the anti-apartheid movement in, that happened in South Africa because it brought down apartheid in South Africa. It was the coming together of generations of activists throughout the world, together with trade unions and key politicians. Dismantling apartheid was the key aim of the anti-apartheid movement. But what we need to keep in sight is a complete dismantling of the colonial project and have a restoration of Palestinian rights to housing, civil liberties and economic equality. The anti-apartheid movement emerged during the post-war era following the election of the National Party in 1948 the same year that Israel was created, which then brought in laws that enabled the system of apartheid in South Africa and the full segregation of whites and blacks that was effectively a form of white supremacy. It wasn't long before events in South Africa caught the attention of activists around the world, particularly in the UK, during an era that was symbolic of the end of empire and where countries, particularly in Africa, were seeking independence from former colonial powers. This was the backdrop that the anti-apartheid movement emerged from. Um, a paper from the Journal of Southern African Studies charts the emergence of the anti-apartheid movement in the UK. Spearheading the movement in South Africa was an African National Congress and the South African Indian Congress, influenced by Gandhi's independence movement in India. During the 1950s, protests against the regime began to build. This was against a backdrop of a continued clampdown and increased repression by the authorities. However, two actions demonstrated how effective boycotting can be, and that's where we, we have to rely on the energy of BDS and faith of the successful boycotting of the apartheid regime in South Africa, of the economic wealth. 
in South Africa, in, well, actually, if I'll just go from what I've written, in the towns of Everton and Alexandra, residents walked to destinations or used a less efficient rail service instead of buses as a protest against rising fares. After a year, the bus company relented, withdrew the fare increases and agreed to build bus shelters and to run buses to a timetable drawn up in consultation with the residents. The grassroots had a power to rise up and control what was happening to them. I'm not sure we, how, it's hard to, to replicate that in terms of the Palestinian case because Israel has systematically removed leadership from the Palestinian communities. The British did it first. So they've systematically had their societies fragmented. They've systematically had leadership removed, whether jailed or killed. And that makes it very hard at this point in time for leadership to emerge. The young generation at the moment do not see any political, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't sense that there's any political choices that they see available to them. The Palestinian Authority is powerless, is, is, is merely a puppet of politics. The PLO has, has basically lost its um, influence in any sense since the Oslo Accords, which people now realise were not a sincere effort at peace at all within the nation. And that sort of brings me on to... How much time have I got left? That... you got about... <laughs> Three minutes again. Oh, right. <laughs> so I, I think that that helps me sort of bring to a conclusion the fact that we've been... Zionism is the ultimate deceiver. From the minute the Zionist movement was created, it has spun politics around. It's exported its politics throughout the Western world and it planted its politics in many political parties throughout the Western imperialist nations. And I think we saw that work so effectively in the removal of Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, because the Zionist movement, aka Margaret Hodge, <laughs> did not relent for one minute. And actually now we're, we're also seeing within Radio 4, only the other day, calling the National Union of Students anti-Semitic. And what a cheek, they don't control what we think. But Margaret Hodge also was alluding to feeling like a child from the Nazi era. There's just ridiculous lies that influence people. And that's part of what the Jewish role in anti-Zionism for me is about spreading the message that Jewish people belong where they're born or where they reside. They're human beings like everybody else. They don't need a nation. They certainly don't need a nation poisoned with hate. And we are Semitic people, like the Palestinians are. We're part of the Abrahamic religions, just like Islam is and just like Christianity is. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Naomi, very much. Okay, here to Mick, and uh, I think that uh, we are going to listen 15 minutes' time again the heart of the subject from your own experience and knowledge. <laughs> Thanks, Hassan. A real pleasure to be at this table with Hassan, Eirig and Naomi. Um, I think the key equation I would suggest is that solidarity is only possible on, if there are two things. One, resistance by the people who are oppressed. If there's no resistance, you can't give solidarity. You can give sympathy. You can give charity, you can give all sorts of things, but no solidarity. Solidarity is always solidarity with resistance. Can't be anything else. And secondly, it's, it, it rises to a higher level if there's complicity by one's own government and, and, and corporations. So I think that mixture of complicity and resistance is what engenders solidarity. I was involved as a callow youth at Strathclyde University with the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign. And you know something? We won. America killed three million Indo-Chinese, invaded the country, despoiled the soil, poisoned it, 
uh, people are still dying, children are still born with hideous deformities because of the, the grotesque crimes, mass murder, extermination, right across the whole land. But an alliance of Vietnamese resistance, American citizens, even American soldiers who started killing their officers and people around the world, including in Glasgow and Edinburgh and Aberdeen and Dundee, that together defeated American militarism. The target was American militarism. It wasn't American people. The Vietnamese well understood the distinction. The Vietnamese could easily have blown up buildings in America. They chose not to because they understood that there was a dynamic movement in America on their side. There were other people who were not quite on their side but thought America was making a big mistake and wanted empire to behave in a different way. But there was a mass movement in solidarity with the Vietnamese resistance. And we chanted victory to the Viet Cong. We chanted about Ho Chi Minh. There was no holding back. People were 100% with the Vietnamese resistance and against the crimes of the British government. Because British governments didn't, didn't send troops to Vietnam. They were a bit afraid to do that. But they gave unstinting support to America otherwise. And the chance of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Resonated around the world. When 30,000 of us marched in London to the US Embassy, ready for very militant action. It frightened the government. The government was very worried. In America, of course, they had to start killing American students in order to defeat the anti-war movement, and they couldn't do that. But even in Britain, the government began to be afraid of the militancy in the colleges and universities and also in the trade unions as well. And it was that fear that was necessary to instill in them with a solidarity movement. It wasn't lobbying, it wasn't going and using fine words to say, Harold Wilson, President, uh, Prime Minister Wilson, you know what you're doing. You know there's B-52s destroying a hundred villages in one raid, burning people in, by the hundreds. You know that, don't Of course he knew it, he's got an intelligence service. But he was bending to American power and the only thing that would prevent that was he had to realise there was a countervailing power in Britain and in America, a popular power that could, that, that could, uh, that could uh, defeat that, could actually defeat American militarism. That for me is solidarity. And I carry the lesson of that, that an alliance between resistance in a colonial country and people in the metropolitan countries like America, Britain, Germany, France, Italy, and so on, that alliance can be successful, can be victorious. How we achieve that is up for grabs. We need to debate, discuss, and find the best way. We need to find the, 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 the vulnerabilities in our enemies. We need to find the best place to put our energies in order to fight. For, for Scottish PSC, it's been against the JNF, against the, the racist Jewish National Fund, and we've managed to drive them from the public sphere in many ways. They no longer do public fundraising. We've taken on their sending cultural troops to the Edinburgh Festival because we thought we could do that. We thought we could win that. It was ambitious, but we could win it. We, 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 we take on uh, musical quartets and disrupt that. You know, we, can, we couldn't go to a heavy metal concert and make any impact on that because we, it's just too noisy. But, a, but a, a delicate musical quartet uh, in Edinburgh, that's, that's actually very vulnerable indeed. We're looking for vulnerabilities and that's where we put our energy. On the Scottish PSE website, we say we are an extension to the Palestinian struggle for freedom. We see we're in the same trenches. And you know, it's not just moral outrage. If you go to Palestine, you'll be morally outraged. The shoot to kill, the killing today of a, of a man who argued with a soldier at a checkpoint. Right now, arguing gets you shot dead. There's, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's A to Z of criminality and horror that we could talk about. But moral outrage doesn't carry you over the finishing line. I think it's important to realise that we face the same enemy. The enemy that wants to, and Starmer I heard on the radio coming here, the enemy that wants to privatise the health service, the enemy that wants to push refugees back into the channel, Suella Braverman, challenged by a Holocaust survivor yesterday, 
who said, this is, this is my experience repeated in the channel today. And Braverman doubled down and said, you know, basically to hell with you, I don't care, I'm going to carry on doing it. To know that your enemy, the people who mean you harm here in Britain, are the people who mean the Palestinians great harm as well. I think that is to see a basis for solidarity in terms of joint interest. That when we fight for the Palestinian people, we're fighting against militarism. When Palestine action go on the roof of arms companies and tackle them and try and shut them down and then go to court and win and win and win, they are fighting companies in Britain at Crew Toll and elsewhere who send weapons to people to murder. It's like Murder Incorporated. Britain still sells, as far as I know, they did two years ago, sniper rifle parts to the Israelis while they were mowing down industrial numbers of Palestinians in the Great March of Return, killing hundreds and maiming many, many thousands, deliberately maiming them. So I think solidarity is very much a struggle for victory. It's not bearing witness. It's not wanting to be clean and nice. It's saying that we have a duty and also a responsibility, but also it's in our interest to clean up our society, to clean up a society with Suella Braverman, with Starmer and others who support militarism, who support ethnic cleansing, not just in Palestine, but in the, in the Indian Ocean as well, uh, where Britain is still involved in ethnic cleansing or, or the, 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 the detritus of ethnic cleansing. So, so I, I, I think solidarity means being in the trenches with the people who are being violated by our governments by our corporations and and not to take it not to take up that struggle not to be in solidarity with them is to allow our lives here to be dictated by the very worst elements in society um, Edward Said chastised Yasser Arafat for going to America and meeting with Zionist organizations in his eloquent way he said what the hell are you doing when you go to America, go and speak to black groups. Go and speak to the groups who are possible allies for the Palestinian struggle. Don't go and speak to your enemies. Don't go and speak to the people who are the very worst, the very last people who will ever, who, ever come over to your side. So in terms of solidarity, I think it's been a great outreach in, into the environmental movement. We have to be looking for allies, but we have to know who our allies are not. And, and let's be sober about this. The Confederation of Friends of Israel in Scotland organized an event very near here, supporting everything Israeli, everything, ethnic cleansing, killing, etc., etc. That meeting was endorsed by Nicholas Sturgeon. Anybody in the SNP here? Raise the issue. Was endorsed by the Labour Party leader, Kezia Dugdale at that time. Anybody in the Labour Party? Raise it. And the Lib Dem guy as well, of course. Now, the Confederation of Friends of Israel talk about euthanizing Palestinians. Some of them welcomed the massacre in the Christchurch mosque three years ago, in two different mosques by a white supremacist. Some of them on their Facebook, I've got the, I've got the images, uh, welcomed this. This organization is so degenerate, it's beyond the pale. Sturgeon, Dugdale, the Labour Party, the SNP endorsed their event and when they were written to and asked to stop it, they didn't even answer. A left-wing group organises an anti-racism march in Glasgow every year. Israeli flags are allowed. Zionism, uh, anti-Zionism is, is anti-Semitism is carried on that march. It's the, the degree of complicity in Britain bites really deep. It's not just the government. It's not just, it's not just a, a, a corporate Britain. It comes right down to something very near us. As I may remember, I was involved in a particular fight with somebody. Uh, it was an SNP MP who boasted how he went, to, went into Westminster and wore a little Palestine pin like this. In fact, exactly this. But he wrote an article about how anti-Semitic the pro-Palestine movement was. It was a disgusting article. It was early in the current barrage of, that's now led to the IHRA and everything else. But he wasn't a false friend. He was the most meagre, timid, 
wearing a badge and he wanted a medal struck for him. And at the same time, he's attacking us as anti-Semitic. So just what Irish said earlier, we have to evaluate who are our allies, where can we build alliances, where can we reach out to people who really want to fight, who really want to campaign, and you fight in many different ways, right? I don't mean we all have to be cut, cut from the same cloth, nothing like it. But we have to reach out for allies and know where our allies are not. You're never going to get endorsement for the Board of Trade. You will get support from trade unions. That support needs to be stronger, more active and more focused, but you will get support. And therefore we have to conclude where our allies are and where they are not. I'll just finish by saying, desires organize. I've got a picture of something called a political training day that took place in Glasgow. And in the political training day, you see the photographs, people from the Israeli embassy, a diplomat, Confederation of Friends of Israel, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. They work together. The Scottish Council of Jewish Communities presents itself as a community body, and it does that in some aspects of it that are actually true, but it's an unremittingly Zionist organization which works together with with other Zionist organizations to push an Israeli agenda and to smear everybody in this room and, and ourselves as anti-Semites. They don't, they don't stop, they're at it. Now, if you, if, if you say the National Union of Students, sorry, the Union of Jewish Students works as part of the Zionist lobby in Britain, anti-Semitic, and, you and you'll be kicked out of your job and you'll, 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 you'll face all sorts of smears. It's true. We have the photographs. You know, what's that, what's that um, Scottish comedian? Um, anyway, he's dead funny, but he does a... He went to the same school as me, Holyrood. Uh, <laughs> Frankie Boyle. Frankie Boyle. Frankie Boyle. Frankie Boyle does a really funny skit. You know, I'm old enough to remember a TV series called Colombo. You know, a wee guy, a wee grubby guy with a trench coat and so on, and... He shuffled about and he always solved the case. But it was a very funny, very funny uh, uh, pr program because you, shot, you saw the murder at the beginning. You saw the murder at the start and then the program was all about how Colombo would solve it and put two and two together and finally get his, get his man or his woman at the end. In terms of Zionism, and Frankie Boyle would joke, he and his granny would be watching the programme and his granny would say, I think it was so-and-so did it. Granny, we saw it at the beginning. Frank, <laughs> we saw it. It's, oh no, I think it was a guy with a black... <laughs> granny, we saw it. Right? Now with Zionism, we saw it, we know it all. They are open, they are public. They want no Palestinians left in Palestine. They want ethnically cleansed, ethnic cleansing to run the whole gamut. They, they're racist to the core. Their origins reach back. The, the, the father of settlement in the land of Israel, Arthur Rupin, Arthur Rupin, met with Hitler's chief racial scientist in 1933, and they got on swimmingly. They both agreed Jews should get the hell out of Europe. They both agreed they had no place in Europe. They, they worked together with the Nazis up until and just before the final solution. I'm not saying they, before the final solution, they worked together hand in glove. And not just the Nazis, every anti-Semite who said, Jews out of Europe, who's going to agree with them? The anti-Semites are going to agree with them. If, God forbid, Muslims decided Britain was a lost cause and they were leaving somewhere to violate some people somewhere else in the world, God forbid that should happen. It's a mind experiment. But if some Muslims did say that, who's going to support them? It'll be the neo-Nazis. It'll be the worst elements who hate Muslims would join in. Look, I'll finish by saying this. Uh, if, yes, if please do. Yeah. You, I'm sorry, I really try and finish me. No, you times. are okay by within the time, times, but yeah. By saying 18 times, I'll finish now, but I will yeah. finish now. This is the time we're alive. Our government, our corporate structures, 
elements of society right down to, to the whole of Parliament, virtually the whole of Edinburgh City Council, if you watch the video, how they adopted the IHRA and so on and so on, are complicit in the crimes. But the Palestinians continue to resist. They continue to resist. And as long as they resist, it's a time bomb ticking underneath the Zionist project and they can ultimately be victorious. A million Algerians died, three million Vietnamese died, countless people across the world have died struggling for their freedom. The Palestinians are paying a very high cost indeed, but they can ultimately be victorious and we can lessen the cost. Okay, thank you, Mick. Just talking a little bit about the, uh, the Palestinian people resistance, I can assure you what, what's happening actually not during today or yesterday or a month ago or years ago. I think that our people, they prove day after day that's no other way than resisting the Zionist colonialist settler project. When you think about it from the beginning of the year until now, yesterday they been 13 youngster being shot dead because they they just resisting the, the 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 Israeli military and just became before we came here you somebody mentioned about this 47 years old by name of Muhammad Abu Kahle near Jerusalem he was driving a car with his son they've been stopped they wanted to to take his son from the car. So he start arguing with them why, and they shot him dead. Just as simple as that. This is just hours ago. Anyhow, one aspect which I would like as a Palestinian now to emphasize, which uh, it is very important. I know that the Palestinian cause for all of you is a just cause. But the aspect which Mick touched upon, it is not only morally to support the Palestinians, stand in solidarity with them. It is in the interest of the people of this country when you think about it. When you're standing for Palestine with the whole aspect of the Palestinian cause, you're defending yourself, you're defending your rights as a citizen here, you're defending your, all the problems which you are facing. This is a very, very important message. Anyhow, I know I'm not going to breach on the breaches here. All of you, you are aware and you are active, but please do, if anybody wanted to raise an issue, to comment, just uh, stand up and go ahead. Uh, yes, please. At the end, at the end there. Hi, um, my name is Peter Gregson. Uh, I suppose there's a, something that a lot of people are involved in in the UK um, that folk don't talk about much, which is the twinning network. Uh, the British-Palestine friendship and twinning network is, um, is, is acting in solidarity in a different way by directly relating to Palestinians in cities and towns um, th through a sort of friendship network. Um, and there's 44 such groups in the UK. Uh, the one in Dundee is probably the oldest. It's been going since 1980. And this to me is, is quite significant because the one in Dundee is very established. It's got the Fire Brigades Union heavily involved and I mean, they actually got a fire engine to Nablus and they bring firefighters from Nablus to Dundee to train and they do a lot of work with schools so they're building quite strong links uh, uh, amongst the community of Dundee which is obviously helped by a, a very supportive Dundee council and so quite often these groups are twin, twinning without much support from the council. I mean I, I'm chairman of the Edina Gaza Twinning Association so we work with Gaza and we do everything online so we promote people getting websites built in Gaza because they're all learning IT because <laughs> the Israelis can't control the internet. 
And we do classes every week with people in Gaza who want to learn better English. And we learn a bit of Arabic. And it's all free because it's on Zoom. So this is a way of, of telling people in Gaza that they're not alone. Um, uh, because a lot of people in Gaza think everyone in the world hates them, you know. <laughs> you can imagine kids growing up with that kind of idea. So we make a big effort to work with children. So that's one kind of solidarity. I think um, looking at uh, what Palestinians want is a big question for me. And it seems clear to me that Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. Um, the bulk of Palestinians uh, would say that they want a single-state solution, that they don't uh, want Israel to continue. Now, this is something that we in Britain kind of shy away from because we have a parliament in Westminster and all the main political parties, they all say two state, two states, two state. But the Palestinians are recognizing that there will never be a two state because Israel will never actually allow it. You know, whatever happened with Oslo is never going to happen. So this move towards a, a single state is something that a lot of people are beginning to embrace. And I think, you know, if we're in solidarity, we should be embracing what the Palestinians want. Um, just to take it a bit further, I mean, the Palestinians elected Hamas as their representatives in 2006, um, which we in the West have described as a terrorist organization. But these are the agents that the uh, Palestinians voted for. And I think this is a huge problem because the people that the Palestinians elected are deemed criminals in this country. So there's a lot more solidarity than just saying, let's help the Palestinians. I think you need to embrace what the Palestinians want. And I'd be interested to know what a few people agreed. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. thank you, thank you. Uh, probably I just uh, needed to, to comment on a very important issue. Obviously, the Indianapolis twinning project is one of the most successful twinning projects in this country. I'm aware of that. But about the last point of what the Palestinian want, me personally, I was been discussing this particular point with many selective uh, groups all over the places. People historically, when they talked about one-state solution or two-state solution or three-state solution, that's not the right way to tackle the Palestinian issue, I think. That's my view. I think what we ask the different solidarity campaigners and organizations, friends, promote the basic recognized internationally rights of the Palestinian people. Freedom, occupation, self-determination, and uh, the right of the refugee to return. This is the main core of the Palestinian cause, not the one state or two state solution. Once these basic internationally recognized rights are achieved, then it would be up to us, our neighbors, whoever, to do a one state, three states, five states, asking the union with, uh, I don't know, Chile or uh, Nepal. It's up to us. The main issue now, it is not the one state solution or two state solution. It is about the, again, internationally recognized national rights of the Palestinian people, which is denied. Actually, this is what it's all about. Anyhow, I will leave it to, to the panel to, to, to comment on that later. If anybody wanted to intervene again, any discussion or any aspects? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Mike Minninter, I'm with Ed and Braxton for Palestine and the Iona community. Um, I think when we think about Palestinians' own actions, then what was said to me as recently as October uh, was that living there is resistance, you know, so that we needn't look for um, dramatic action from Palestinians, 
but look for continuing existence, I would suggest. And the question that I'd like to ask is, um, recently we've seen the extremism of the Israeli government and their own words make blatant those things which we used to have to argue for. So how do we capitalize on that? I mean, to us, it was obvious. But now we quote Netanyahu, we quote Smotrich. We don't need to say, I have seen. And so how do we build on that? Um, and I would have been wondering for quite a while whether we should be pushing the notion of anti-Palestinianism far harder in the way in which anti-Semitism has been weaponized. If you look at the IHRA statement and then uh, invert that and say, well, this is what it says is anti-Semitic, but look at what Israel is doing. Um, not quite sure about the logic of that, but the key thing for me, uh, key suggestion would be that anti-Palestinianism is something that we can name far more strongly than we have. And how do we do that? And how do we capitalize on that? And, or do you agree? Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Manal. I'm from Palestine. Um, I'm not sure if you already talked about this or not because I arrived late. Um, but I want to uh, talk about Masaf Riyatta. Um, Masaf Riyatta is located um, in the south of the West Bank. And I just wanted to say that uh, we should increase more uh, actions, solidarity actions um, and awareness raising actions about what is happening in Masaf Riyatta because um, the new Israeli government is accelerating and intensifying its uh, ethnic cleansing uh, practices of Masaf Riyatta and uh, recently, the Israeli government announced that they will uh, displace uh, for people living in 14 communities in Masaf Riyatta, um, which, is, which are located in an area that is classified by the Israelis as uh, firing zone 19, 18, uh, 918. Um, so people on Masaf Riyatta really need our support. Exposing what is happening is really important and also visiting them and showing solidarity with them, having kind of events, webinars, uh, connecting with people on the ground um, is really important because they are doing their best to uh, stay on the land, but this regime is very vicious and they are intensifying violence against them um, in order to ethnically cleanse them. So, yeah, we need more actions um, in order to stop that or at least to uh, expose what is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Any other comments? Questions? Okay, but also you wanted to tackle a few issues which was being raised there. Eirik, any? Um, <laughs> thanks, Manal. I made a brief mention of Masafayata earlier, but uh, mm. thank you very much. And so, I just reiterate, if anybody knows anybody who may be in a position to go to Masafayata in solidarity, speak to Manal at the end. Uh, she's the oracle on, on that. Um, maybe a couple of things. Um, the, um, so I suppose working, working through this, I, 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 I'm inclined to agree with Issam. You know, there's, a, there's a logic to the one democratic state arg argument, but I don't think it's any of my business how many states. If any of the states that are occurring in the Middle East um, uh, exploit or demonize or expel or, or persecute or murder um, any other group as a result of their ethnicity of the, in the, or their indigeneity, then I do have a, a responsibility to stand in solidarity with the oppressed groups, however many states, but it's up to the Palestinians uh, um, to decide how many states, uh, or even though the, I can see the logic to the one democratic state argument. Um, I, I think the opportunities that Mike made about the right-wing government, as, as, um, you know, as, as you rightly say, you know, most of us are, are saying, well, yeah, what, 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 
how much change is it? You know, Netanyahu was hardly a kind of soft liberal um, uh, before he, he went into coalition with the, the ultra-fascists. But um, what is happening is that it's reaching a wider audience. Even the BBC are covering sometimes issues in Palestine without simply reading out the, the script that the Israeli government press release has given them. Um, so uh, it, it has become so outrageous, so explicit uh, with this right-wing government that there are opportunities that we maybe have to reach wider audiences. Um, I, I think, just kind of going back to some of the points that, that Mick was making about the Zionist movement or, uh, organizing in, in, um, uh, in Scotland and in the UK, um, the, the three, three issues that I raised at the beginning, the, the one about what is genuine decolonizing solidarity, BDS and civil society, that's exactly what the Zionists are doing. They say, how do we, how do we obfuscate genuine solidarity, uh, decolonizing society? We set up all these normalization projects. We set up these, we, you know, we talk about peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. We talk about joint ventures. We talk about um, the, the recent um, uh, Friends of Roots UK um, initiative that was supposed to be speaking in the, in the Scottish Parliament before we got rid of them. Um, uh, saying, well, it's, it, there are two different visions about, about um, uh, the West Bank. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Jews think that they belong there and Palestinians think they belong. Let's just talk to one another, you know. Uh, this kind of nonsense is, uh, is, is rightly to be challenged. But that's exactly what the Zionists are doing. That's what they're doing. They're saying, mm -hmm. let's, let's set up little projects like that that make it look as if we want to talk, talk peace but actually what we want to do is to re, uh, uh, reinforce oppression. Um, BDS, they're frightened of it, the Zionists. So that's why all this anti-Semitism is, is being thrown at, at um, solidarity activists. BDS is, is working, that demonstrates it's working because, because of that. But, but that's what the Zionists are doing. And, you know, a group of hardcore Zionists in Scotland wouldn't be any bigger group than this. You know, they would have deeper pockets, I think, than, with, than we have. But um, but, they, but, you know, the size of the hardcore Zionists is, is not great. But they, they are doing the kind of things that we should be doing, strategizing, moving throughout civil society, infiltrating uh, uh, anti-racist groups, um, making churches afraid of saying, yes, we support BDS, making um, uh, trade unions more timid, uh, the, the, than they should be. So that's what the Zionists are doing. We need to take on the Zionists yeah. um, and, uh, and we need to stand up for solidarity. Yep, there's not much I can disagree with there. Um, the, the punishments that are coming out to the Palestinian Authority for even daring to raise their argument about the new government is pretty punitive. 30 to 39 million have been removed from their budget, or is it billion? Um, economically, they're going to be driven very, very, into a very difficult position. Hamas, I, in response to Pete's um, point, I'm not sure when the last election was allowed amongst Palestinians, so I don't know how anybody... 2006. 2006. Yep. So we'd, we're not in a position to really understand what the Palestinians want politically because they've not had the opportunity to express anything in a political sense. Um, <clears throat> I think I'd, I was meant to end on a, a kind of um, hopeful note from the Jewish, the Jewish um, Network for Palestine. And do you mind if I read this out? Yes, carry yeah, on. Okay. Is that okay? Go ahead. You will get the microphone, Matt. It's okay. Um, so the, the Jewish Network for Palestine have set up the Convivienza Alliance, which was launched on May the 8th last year. And part of their press release is this. Um, it's a new initiative to help bring a, a just peace in the Middle East, which was launched invoking the periods of mutual coexistence which have been enjoyed by the three Abrahamic faiths in medieval Spain and the Ottoman Empire. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, have you? <laughs> Um, I, w I was encouraged to finish in this because it's apparently a, a, a ray of, of hope and a ray mm. of light to, to end what is a very difficult discussion. 
Conviviensa is a cross-faith international initiative for a just peace in the Middle East that seeks to substitute the current militarised solutions based on racist oppression, brute force, denial of rights and colonial dispossession with an approach predicated on shared values and commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. An academic term proposed by Spanish phil philologist Américo Castro, Convivienza describes the period of Spanish history from the Muslim conquest of southern Spain in the 8th century to their expulsion alongside Jews from 1492. The period is regarded as a golden age in which the three faiths lived cheek, peacefully, cheek by jowl, creating a climate of intellectual and artistic prowess unequalled in the world. The same was true of the Ottoman period from the 14th to the 20th century, in which Palestine provided a safe place for people of all the Abrahamic faiths to live in relative harmony and flourish. They shared common Arab culture and lived in the same neighbourhoods until the advent of political Zionism. Convivienza rejects political Zionism, which it sees as exclusivist Jewish settler colonial project from its inception, intending to expel the Palestinian indigenous population. The Convivi Convivienza initiative extends to, all, to people of all faiths and none who are committed to these values. Instead of dividing people, this approach unites them in a search for a just peace based on equality for all in Palestine, Israel. It hopes to draw on the concept of justice that is central to all three monotheistic faiths, aiming to create a political system that combines equality, justice and universal human rights in order to deliver peace, democracy and the rule of law. The intention follows the original Palestine Liberation Organisation programme towards building a shared political community through a process of decolonisation beginning with Palestine. This requires an end to Zionism, apartheid and occupation, and building a just and democratic civic society in the whole of Palestine. Convivencia also rejects prevailing interfaith dialogue that is driven by a Zionist agenda, silencing any discussion of the Palestinian rights. There is more of which I'll leave, because um, it's quite long. Yeah, if you could leave uh, some pamphlets for people who wanted to take. Yeah, well, I, only, uh, yeah. I can maybe copy some yeah, in the office. Sure. Okay. Um, I, think, I think what comes through to me from that is that the one democratic state which has been promoted from the Palestinian society is something that we adopt and we bring as much as we can the different groups of activists within Scotland, within Britain, within Europe to be a stronger voice to support the Palestinians. Without that, our voices drift. Okay, thank you, Naomi and Mick. I think that uh, there's a few issues you wanted to comment on, aren't you? Very briefly. Yeah. Um, twinning is, uh, is useful, but it's, even at its best, in, in Dundee, it's a charity, and they often look over their shoulders about what they say, because uh, charities have to be looking over their shoulders about what they say, unless they're Zionist charities or right-wing charities. So it it's, can be useful if it's driven from below. Um, on the new government, Mike, I read an interesting article recently. Some people are talking about the new government in Israel as being fascist. And you know, terminological inexactitude can take you in the wrong direction. The problem with the Zionist government in Israel, Palestine, is it has always been murderous. It has always used naked violence and massacre when appropriate in order to cleanse the land of Palestinians. So fascism, fascism comes in Germany in 1933. They've got a parliamentary democracy, they can demonstrate, there's relative freedom. Um, and then fascism means everybody, you know, people get put in concentration camps, communists, left-wingers, trade unions. Fascism is, is a crushing of the previous 
political system and its replacement by something totalitarian. I think what's specific about the new government in Israel is that although naked violence reminiscent of fascism has always been deployed against the Palestinians, that's not fascism, that's colonialism. That's what's happened in every colony that Europe's ever spawned around the world. What's now happening is people like uh, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, they're now turning on so-called Jewish leftists and you're going to get something akin to fascism for Jews. But Palestinians have always lived under naked, massive violence. And I think to talk about the government as fascist is to mask the fact, is to suggest there's a fall from grace where there was no grace before. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll just make a final remark if I may. I've always thought about the American Constitution, you know, the pursuit of happiness. And I've always thought, if, imagine you met somebody whose goal in life was the pursuit of happiness. Uh, what are you doing in life, son? I, I, I want to be happy. I'm pursuing happiness at all costs. That would it'd be a ludicrous situation. You can't pursue happiness. Fulfillment or happiness comes from other things that you do in life. And peace also is not an absolute goal. You cannot pursue peace in a sense. You can pursue justice and peace will be a byproduct. You can pursue injustice and, and war will be an inevitable byproduct as well. So in Palestine, I, it, it can all be summed up. I think early on in this discussion Ray made the point, decolonization, de-Zionization, the, the removal of the apartheid structures that mean Palestinians. Look, Palestinians I spoke to, if you want to talk about two or three state solution, one of them said, look, I just want to go 10 kilometers up the road. I can't get there because there's a bloody checkpoint. I can't get to the clinic or see my family because of checkpoints. Two state, schmoo state. We want to remove the, the, the oppressive structures that we have to live under. And I think when we look at it in the, in the round, that's what we should be, that's what we should be talking about. Um, Edinburgh friends of it. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, it didn't say that. I made that up. He's far, he's far too polite to say that. Friends, here, here, you want some hope? Edinburgh Friends of Israel was set up, they've since disappeared. They were set up at a meeting, and most of their groups across Scotland have disappeared. There's just a bunch of rabid nutcases in Glasgow, really, and a couple of people in Inverness, as far as I know. But they were set up in Edinburgh, and there was a brief report um, in, about the meeting in the, Bot the Botanic Gardens. And the guy said, look, there was hardly any Jews there. It was all Christian fundamentalists mm. who were setting it up in Edinburgh, right? Now that's the report of what happened. It did happen. And, uh, and I, met, I, I missed a meeting, maybe I was at it. I missed a meeting, my partner Sophia was at it. And apparently it was a soggy little thing. But there was a Jewish rabbi there and somebody asked the, the, asked the rabbi, uh, did they have discussions there on Israel? And she said, my God, we couldn't possibly. That would be civil war. We can only have discussions of Israel in the Jewish community in Edinburgh if somebody comes from the outside to, to, uh, to, to, to monitor it and, make, and keep us away from each other's throats. There is a large proportion of people who don't have the confidence to put their head above the parapet, but they're not bloody Zionists. They're not tough-minded pro-Israel. This... This block will break at one stage, right? It'll split wide open. The last statistics I saw for a serious opinion poll of British Jews was that it was a very large 40 odd percent did not call themselves Zionists. Now you have to look at these figures very carefully and you, you don't want to be too, your specs don't need to be too rose, rose, rose tinted. But our enemy is not as strong as we think it is. If we can organize, if we can build relations with Palestinians resisting on the ground in Palestine and with the diaspora, if we can amplify the Palestinian voice, which in Scotland is a key task, um, then I think we can be victorious. But in this business to win, Vietnamese won independence, Algerians won independence, lots of anti-colonial struggles were bloody as hell, but they won independence. We will never know to what extent we can reduce the cost. But the more determined we are, then the, the more that cost will be reduced by a finite amount. That's just, that's just how the world turns. So these are dark times, but let's carry on struggling. Okay, guys. I think that uh, despite... Uh,
small audience, and uh, but I think that we touch on very important aspect of the what does mean solidarity with Palestine. It just uh, on last word on the issue of the political solution. I just wanted to mention something. Just usually I do mention it when I'm talking about the, the political aspect and the solution. Even the people who claiming the, the two-state solution or three-state solution whatsoever, or even one-state solution, it's bloody is not the time, it is not an agenda. It is the way forward. It is competing Zionism as a racist, settler colonialism ideology. That's the whole issue. But nobody put into the Palestinian on the table tomorrow, okay, here. It is not practically possible to do two-state solution. There's nothing left for the Palestinian to have a state within what so-called two-state solution. So why are you talking about? Either you naive or basically you want to just to avoid standing for the Palestinian right as in a solidarity as was being summarized in all these discussions. So thank you for the panel, thank you the audience and uh, thanks very Phil. Much, uh, yeah, thanks very much Sam and thanks very much for everyone yeah, for participating tonight. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to a little bucket here um, which uh, is begging you to put something into it. These things are not run um, you know, on air, on thin air, so we uh, would like a, a contribution if you could tonight and look out for our next event, which will be in kind of mid-February, I think, which is um, the streamed film, Naila and the Uprising, which I think you'll enjoy. It's a lovely film, actually.